From the newsrooms of the Sydney Morning Herald and The Age, this is The Morning Edition. I'm Samantha Salinger-Morris. It's Thursday, November 7th. Donald Trump's supporters don't always get the facts right when they big note him. But the day after the election, they were right on the money. As Vice President-elect J.D. Vance put it, we really did just witness one of the greatest political comebacks in the history of the United States. But what's behind the stunning reversals that underpinned his win? Today, North America correspondent Farrah Thomason on why women flocked to Trump when they were expected to lead Kamala Harris to victory over the issue of abortion rights. And why Donald Trump now has a voting base so broad that it's even stunned many Republicans. So, Farah, we are recording this on Thursday afternoon, and it's the day after Donald Trump was declared the winner of the presidential election. And I really actually want to get your take on what the mood is there on the ground where you are in Washington, D.C., and how you're feeling, I guess, the day after this verdict. Yeah, I mean, the mood on the ground is pretty somber, to be honest. Last night, uh, I was at um, Kamala Harris's watch party at Howard University, and, you know, it was filled with thousands of people, and everyone was really excited. And as the vote count wore on, uh, things got a little bit, uh, people got a little bit triggered with, uh, I guess, memories of Hillary Clinton 2016. And I must say, it was kind of sad. You know, people were crying. There were, uh, this is Howard University, just for context, is a historically black university. So there's a lot of pride in these places to see, you know, I, th- I think a woman of colour, you know, who had obviously gone to great heights to the second highest office in the land and and the students they were so proud of her and they were so excited of ushering you know to usher in um potentially uh, america's first female president and to see this happen for her to sort of not make it um i think it was very devastating for them and there have been you know two people that donald trump has defeated uh, and both of them are women and uh one of them uh was able to defeat him and that's uh, joe biden who's a bloke so there have been a lot of questions around I suppose, you know, sexism existing uh, in this country. And uh, I think there's just a a lot of um, people who are just wondering, how did this happen? Well, this is what I want to get into with you, because, you know, we have heard quite a bit really about how how he won it, you know, which states went to him and so forth. But I really want to talk to you about why he won, you know. So what were the key issues, do you think, that really swung the election his way? Look, I guess there are many reasons uh, as to how Trump was able to kind of stage what was admittedly one of the biggest political comebacks of all time. You know, but but a big reason is this. He has this incredible ability to tap into the fears and the concerns of people who genuinely believe their country is slipping away from them. You know, so for some people that involves an economic decline. You know, they're struggling to pay rent, the cost of groceries have soared, they have to work two jobs to get their kids to school. For others, it's demographics, you know. It is a fact, statistically, that America is becoming less white and more brown. And, you know, there are more black people, more Latinos. Not everyone is happy about that. Uh, When you tie this shift with his rhetoric about an alien invasion at the US-Mexico border, people get really fired up and the threat's off the charts. And and that is a a real threat. I mean, there have been, you know, millions of people crossing the border illegally, and uh, that's put a strain on not just border towns, but, um, you know, cities, uh, New York, Washington, DC over here, Chicago. Sometimes, too, it's also cultural. So his campaign spent millions of dollars to flood battleground states with this highly effective ad that a lot of people haven't really spoken about, but it was a trans anti-trans ad and it used comments that Harris made back in 2019 in which she supported transgender inmates having access to gender-affirming surgery. And the ad sort of ends with this line, Kamala Harris is for they, them, Donald Trump is for you. And, you know, a- again, those issues Cost of living pressures, the economy, uh, immigration, um, you know, this whole notion of woke liberalism. It's something that really resonates with people. And his, his uh, you know, constituency of white working class voters in rural America, they showed up in force. Uh, but when you drill down, it's not just them. It's not just his base. It, he was able to get a broader coalition of voters by really tapping into those concerns. So black voters, Latinos, young men just drawn by this notion that their lives were better during his term. So for me, if the results sort of showed us anything, it was that there's this massive realignment um, that's happened in politics over here, and that is the Republicans as a party um, now appeal more to the working class, while the Democrats have increasingly become a party of college-educated 
upper income suburbanites, particularly women. And it's an incredible turnaround, isn't it, really? Because for so long, the Democrats, they were the party for the working class. Now, you mentioned the role of women and how this group might have played into this result. So let's talk about that, because Kamala Harris and the Democrats, they were counting on women really to turn out in large numbers to to get her over the line. It obviously didn't happen. So why do you think that is? Yeah, well, the polls have been you know, closely examining the gender gap for years. It's always a feature of modern elections. But this year it was supposedly far more pronounced. And for that reason, um, Harris was pushing hard on abortion rights because that resonated with people in terms of, you know, what kind of freedoms they would have going forward as a result of the Supreme Court's decision to overturn Roe versus Wade. Um, And I saw that on, on the ground. I mean, I'd go to battleground states. I was at polling centres when people were voting and I'd ask them, what have you voted on? And women would predominantly come out and go, because I actually want, you know, to have control over my own body, you know, and not have some government and some blokes tell me what to do. That was a really, really big issue. But it turned out that, you know, women did in fact show up for Kamala Harris, but in smaller numbers than they showed up for Joe Biden and Hillary Clinton. Black women are still very much the backbone of the Democratic Party. There's no problem there. They showed up in force and um, she won them, I think, 85 points or higher. But when it comes to white women, she didn't do as well as Hillary Clinton or Joe Biden. And it turns out that a lot of sort of older white women were still voting for Donald Trump more than they were voting for Kamala Harris. And a really interesting aspect of all of this was, of course, that abortion didn't turn out to be the vote winner that the Democrats wanted it to be. And in some places, it looks like women, they did vote for abortion protections on the ballot, but they still supported Trump. So what's going on there? Yeah, I mean, abortion was a big issue for for many women. But I mean, as somebody pointed out uh, earlier today, if you can afford to have an abortion, you are probably, um, you know, middle class or well to do and and that's wonderful. But there are many people who cannot do that in America, um, you know, who or for whom the issue of, you know, being able to just put food on the table while you're raising three kids is far more pertinent than reproductive rights. But in terms of abortion being on the ballot, you're right, there are 10 states um, that had ballot measures and they basically had constitutional amendments that were designed to cement reproductive rights in their state constitution. So as we know, two years ago, the US Supreme Court overturned Roe versus Wade, brought the issue back to the states. As a result, about one in three states in America now have abortion bans or abortion restrictions in some form. So 10 different states um, had these measures and um, I think seven states all up voted for them. So a lot of people can vote for Donald Trump at the top of the ticket and say, yep, I want him as my president running the country, but I don't like this thing that's going to happen in my state. So it turns out that a lot of people did that. They basically split the ticket, Donald Trump was the president, but, you know, yes to enshrining abortion in my particular state. We'll be right back. Okay, and what about how men and in particular, young men, I think, might have helped Trump win this election because I saw, I saw some very interesting commentary by Elizabeth Spears in The New York Times shortly after Trump was declared the winner. And she wrote that, you know, the particular regressive kind of masculinity that Trump represents, you know, in which power over women is a birthright and that dominance over not just women, but really all less powerful groups is is the natural order of things. And it's what's best for everyone, that that actually is the appeal that Trump can offer and that the Democrats just cannot offer. So what do you make of all that? Well, I mean, I guess it's interesting, isn't it? Because he really did sort of push on this kind of, you know, boorish sort of, you know, macho type, play this particular campaign. I mean, we saw that in his um, Madison Square Gardens um, rally where we had all those sort of sexist and, you know, vulgar kind of jokes and and, and that weren't particularly funny. Um, But He's he's unconventional, right? He, people people like that, men and women. He's he's this kind of guy who is anti-establishment. Um, he's they like his emphasis on law and order, his support for gun rights, his anti-transgender messaging. Um, for a lot of men, it appeals if they feel overlooked and misrepresented by mainstream values. And, you know, I mean, the irony, I, I think, is that, you know, they win on style in terms of that sort of whole macho thing, but they don't actually have a lot of substance when it comes to male-oriented policies. But it's interesting that point that, you know, Trump didn't really bring out any policies that were on a concrete level going to help men specifically. But I guess it was just the power of the rhetoric that was so appealing, perhaps, to young 
white white men, you know, because it offers them a group of people to blame, doesn't it? Like, oh, okay, I'm disenfranchised. I can't afford to pay for my groceries. I am feeling, uh, you know, not successful, alienated. Well, it's, you know, it's, it's women and it's minorities, you know, they're they're to blame. Well, yeah, and I think that's also why there's been such a backlash here against things like DEI, which is diversity, um, equity, inclusion programs, um, you know, and there was a lot of kind of somewhat racist sort of trope around Kamala Harris when she was first appointed. They just sort of say stuff like, oh, she's a DEI appointment, as if to say, you know, a woman who happens to be of colour couldn't possibly um, have gotten that job herself, even though she was a former attorney general, a former senator and a current vice president. So, you know, there's that kind of pushback towards things like DEI, um, critical race theory, and Donald Trump is very anti-woke. You know, he's, he's like I said, um, anti-establishment and that kind of rhetoric really appeals to folks who feel like they uh, are being overlooked and that the, the world that they knew and love uh, is, as I said, slipping away. And so do you think, Faz, you know, to sum up, is it safe to say that Trump won because he convinced the American people that he could improve their lives in concrete ways? You know, he'd protect jobs, he'd protect them from the threat of immigrants storming the Mexican border, whereas Kamala Harris's platform was anchored in, in ideas and for some people, lofty ones at that, democracy, equality, unity, and that perhaps because of this, she just wasn't meeting the bulk of people where they were, you know, which is to say struggling to be able to afford groceries. It's funny because when you actually drill down, Trump says nice kind of motherhood statements like, I'm going to stop the invasion at the US-Mexico border. I will launch the biggest deportation in history. I will, you know, fix inflation. I will, you know, create all these jobs. But he doesn't actually specify how, and that's obviously, you know, the hammer to the politician. But Carl Harris did have policies. Her policies were far more detailed. But you've got to remember, this is somebody who has been campaigning for 107 days up against someone who's been around for nine years. Um, and her, her big challenge, I guess, was the fact that she was Biden's vice president. So she she struggled to really kind of create this sense and convince the American people that she was a change agent who could change their lives for the better when all they could see was somebody who was there for the last four years while they've been feeling kind of crap. Although I think it, it does have to be said, there was a lot of criticism about the economic policies that she did put forward. I mean, some some said, you know, they, they she didn't have any big sort of holistic plan, I guess. And that I think I think her one about groceries was sort of laughed about as as this would never happen. So I think there's a fair criticism, perhaps, that her economic policies were not a strength. Oh, look, ab- absolutely. And I mean, but I mean, for Trump to sort of say, I will stop inflation. OK, how? Yeah. Um, oh, absolutely. Oh, he didn't have any he didn't have any policies like at all. And in fact, economists have been very clear to come out to say that the plans that he does have, like the tariffs and so forth, will actually be horrific for the American economy and that it's going to, you know, prices for Americans are going to skyrocket sort of in, in many areas. Oh, absolutely. Both of them um, obviously had had their, their faults. But as I said, Trump's appeal cannot be overlooked. This was, by and large, a, an absolute um, landslide victory. Some Republicans were even shocked in terms of the scale of it. And it is, as he said, I totally agree, one of the greatest political comebacks of all time. And there will be Democrats who are doing a lot of head scratching at the moment as we speak. Well, that's really what I wanted to ask you. Are you getting the sense on the ground, I guess, that the Democratic Party is really questioning its entire identity, you know, not just what it stands for, but what the American people actually want and need? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And I think, um, you know, they didn't help themselves by constantly bringing out these celebrity endorsements. You know, hey, I I don't mind Oprah um, and I don't mind a bit of Tay-Tay, but to just constantly have, you know, the George Clooney's and the Julia Roberts and the um, of, of the world, it just reinforces to people who can't afford to put food on their table that they are a party of elites. It just was not working. And they need to be able to speak to people for whom, um, you know, the the issues that Donald Trump is able to tap into, they need to speak to that to, to those people and not just every four years as well. And that was a gripe that a lot of um, black people and um, Latinos that I spoke to would say every four years they come around and they try to say, oh, talk to me and, you know, what, what can we do for you? But then they disappear. And I think for, for a lot of people that was just not enough. That I was in a taxi in, um, 
in Detroit and I met this guy and he was, a, he was an Uber driver uh, and he's, you know, 49 year old guy and he was a black man. Uh, he's a real estate agent, uh, but he has to drive an Uber as a second job because he can't actually afford to not have a second job now under the current economy. And he was absolutely livid about the fact that Barack Obama came to town and basically said to black men, you're not voting for Kamala Harris because you're a little bit sexist in, in not so many words, but he, he basically did that during a campaign event. And this, this guy was just like, are you kidding me, Barack Obama? You sit there in your golden tower, you know, and you're telling me how to vote and why I'm not voting for Kamala Harris? Like, he was so offended. And as a result of that, he was like, I hate Obama now. And now I look at Kamala in the same light and I just can't, I can't deal with either of them. So it's, uh, they're gonna have to really rethink their strategies, but because uh, this wasn't just a, a, a victory for Donald Trump, that they knew this race was gonna be close. That's what the poll said. This was an absolute hammering. Um, so yeah, there's a lot of Democrats that are here in Washington and beyond just completely gobsmacked and they're doing a lot of soul searching as we speak. Thank you so much, Farah, for your time. You're very welcome. Today's episode of The Morning Edition was produced by Julia Carr-Katzel with technical assistance by Taylor Dent. The Morning Edition is a production of The Age and the City Morning Herald. If you enjoy the show and want more of our journalism, subscribe to our newspapers today. It's the best way to support what we do. Search The Age or smh.com.au forward slash subscribe and sign up for our morning edition newsletter to receive a comprehensive summary of the day's most important news analysis and insights in your inbox every day links are in the show notes i'm samantha salinger morris this is the morning edition thanks for listening